Okay, hi everyone and happy new year. Welcome to our first webinar of 2021 and our first ever joint webinar with the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. My name is Rohini Bajeko and I'm a nutritionist and team member at Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, which is an organisation dedicated to the promotion of a healthy whole foods plant-based way of eating. We are honoured today to be joined by Dr. David L. Katz, a globally recognised authority on lifestyle medicine and preventive medicine expert. He's the founder and former director of Yale University's Yale Griffin Prevention Research Centre and past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, president and founder of the nonprofit True Health Initiative and CEO founder of Diet ID. I highly recommend their webinars. Before we begin, I would just like to thank our sponsors for this session, ProVeg International and VeganFitness.com, who kindly lent us their Zoom platform. We'll also be joined by Dr. Ellen Fallows, um, who is from the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine for our joint Q&A. Um, and of course, both, I really recommend checking out both our organisations, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK and the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. If you're passionate about plant-based nutrition or lifestyle medicine, we have lots of free resources, events and webinars coming up this year. Next week, I'll be joined by Dr. Gemma Newman, who's an NHS GP and author. Her book, The Plant Power Doctor, is due out tomorrow in the UK. And she'll be talking about how to achieve results for a healthier plant-powered life for your patients and yourself. This is another CPD accredited webinar and completely free to join. We will also be joined on the 27th of January for an extra special bonus webinar this, um, this January, given the extra focus on plant-based diets on bone health and vegans with Professor Tim Key from the University of Oxford. So I'd like to now welcome Dr. David Katz to start the presentation to discuss an incredibly important topic for everyone, the evidence between diet and health outcomes, especially in light of the current pandemic, COVID-19. Just to let you know, for those of you who are at all uh, tuned into politics, we, we very much have Georgia uh, on our minds. And so the, the song of the day is courtesy of Ray Charles. Things look good here in the U.S. for those whose politics incline the way mine do. Uh, so I'm happy to join you on what, what looks to be a, a propitious occasion to talk about making sense of diet science. This was the topic we agreed to in advance. And of course, that, that covers a, a range of potential considerations. So I, I've done the best I can to hit some relevant highlights. And this really is how I look at diet from altitude these days. Uh, first of all, we need to talk about our house on fire. And then we can talk about the relevance of trees and forest. Uh, both matter. We need to see the trees and the forest through them. Talk about two roads diverging in that famous yellow wood and why that can make all the difference. A grand confluence, the gravest threat, management and measurement, and how ultimately, if we are to conjoin sense and science with regard to diet, epidemiology, advancing the human condition, this does become a matter of one health. People, planet, biodiversity, all one thing. So this is the Amazon basin. Uh, that's what it's supposed to look like. All too often these days, it looks like this. Now, this is partly, of course, because of Brazil's crazy president who doesn't really care about the fate of this global treasure. Uh, but this is not all about uh, Bolsonaro and, and you know, the, the inclinations toward policy in Brazil. Ultimately, this is about satisfying a global demand by means of this to provide this. And so really anybody who is in on the demand side for beef is part of the reason why we are burning down our house, uh, the crown jewels of this planet uh, to make this available. And, and ultimately, you know, science and sense converge perhaps more poignantly with regard to the critical need to massively reduce global intake of beef than any other single consideration. And, you know, I, as a, I'm an internist and then did a second residency in preventive medicine, public health, and have always been focused on every possible means of adding years to human life, life to human years. 
it's I, I would argue, if anything, I'm somewhat late to the party uh, with regard to environmental science. If I had it all to do over again, I might very well be an environmental scientist because clearly climate change, threats to biodiversity are the signature issue of our time. It may feel like COVID is at the moment, but COVID will come and go. These existential threats to the, the, the sanctity of, of the biosphere will not. Uh, and so I might, I might have chosen a different path. But th the good news is for those of us in lifestyle medicine or anything related to that, and, and frankly, all of you with a focus on nutrition, we have this great opportunity to address the confluence of, of human and planetary health. But I, I do, I, on, the, on the chance that I would otherwise forget to say this before I'm, I'm done speaking, I don't think you can legitimately call yourself a health professional in 2021 unless you advocate frequently and fiercely for the health of the planet, because there are no healthy people on a ruined, uninhabitable planet. There is no health left to talk about. So this, uh, this image is, is a public threat and a public enemy and needs to be regarded as such. Uh, it's a, obviously, uh, it's a threat to ethics too with factory farming and on and on it goes. But this, this is one of the critical issues of our time and obviously I'm preaching to the choir uh, in, in that area. Okay, so I wanna talk about, you know, we're, we're, we're burning down the forests, the, the world's most magnificent forest, the, the rainforest in the Amazon to graze cattle, rainforest in Borneo, uh, for palm oil plantations, uh, which invites us to consider both trees and forests. So I'm going to start with trees because I, I think most of the action actually is the view from altitude, the view of the whole forest. But let's talk about trees. And by that, I mean these specific considerations. And, and I will run through these uh, without overtaxing any one of them. I want to be brisk so I can cover a wide expanse. There's always a trade-off when you give a talk between depth and breadth, and I'm delighted to hear I'm in such fine company in this webinar series, so you'll be getting additional depth on these topics from subsequent speakers as well. But I, th this is a, a link to an interview I did on NPR, How Bad Really Is Red Meat? And I, I really, I, I like to invoke uh, an online article in the conversation from several years ago, which says, meat is a complex health issue, but a simple environmental one. The world needs to eat less of it. Frankly, I, I suspect most of us agree it's not really a complex health issue. The literature has somewhat obscured the harms of meat because all nutritional epidemiology is obligated to address the instead of what question. If you do studies where people eat more or less meat, but the alternative to meat is muffins and donuts and pastries. In other words, you know, less meat, less animal protein, less saturated fat, but more highly refined carbohydrate, ultra processed food and added sugar, Frankly, that's a lateral move in terms of health. So you can design studies that almost intentionally show neutral effects of meat intake per se. Every nutritional study needs to invoke the instead of what question in order for it to make any sense. And again, there is no good science in the absence of sense. I, I would argue as a general principle, and in fact, I do this with uh, every email I send out, it's attached to my signature, Science is the train. Science gives us the power of a freight train to drive towards truths which would otherwise be hard to reach, but sense must lay the tracks. Absent the tracks, you have a train, you get a train wreck. On the other hand, if you just have the tracks of sense, but you don't have science, a lot is out of reach. We really need both, and we, we need to celebrate the confluence of the two. So if we invoke both here, a lot of the studies that raise doubts about the ill effects of meat fail to address the instead of what question. All of the literature that looks at instead of what makes it very clear that if you take meat out of the diet and put in more legumes, more beans, more whole grains, more vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, every kind of health outcome improves. But even if we were willing to be somewhat less decisive about the direct health effects of meat, we don't need to be, but let's say we were to concede that point, I would still argue we wanna look at all things diet related through three lenses. One, direct effects on human health. Two, what does it say about ethics? And you know, obviously factory farming practices associated with global beef production are horrendous, abusive, and cruel. No decent person should want cruelty on the menu. 
And then the third would be environmental impact. And beef is literally off the charts with regard to all of the relevant metrics. And I won't belabor this. I trust many of you know that the comprehensive metric for environmental impact often used is life cycle analysis. The relevant considerations obviously cover uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, effects on, on, on total carbon uh, contribution to the environment and climate change, water utilization, land use, ecosystem incursions, and, and many others. Uh, but by all of the major metrics, greenhouse gas emissions, aquifer depletion, so forth, beef really is, is by far an outsized adverse influence. World needs to eat less. Uh, so if we look through these three lenses, red meat is really quite bad, beef specifically. Um, we need to eat a whole lot less. The Eat Lancet report, with which I'm sure you're all familiar, suggests that the modern world needs to reduce current levels of beef intake by 90% to stay within sustainable boundaries. Okay, well, if we're gonna eat less beef, maybe among the things we'll be eating more of would be grains. Uh, but you know, isn't it true that, that grains are associated with adverse health effects? There's been the argument in grain brain, wheat belly, popular books, we should be eating less grains. Um, frankly, all of this is misguided. Grains have been a mainstay in the human diet since the dawn of agriculture roughly 15,000 years ago. But as I trust many of you know, there are actually archaeologic finds that indicate that grains were a, an important, although smaller part of the native human diet going back as far as 150,000 years. So th this is native human food at this point uh, for a very extended period of time spanning considerable opportunities for adaptation. Uh, the, the other thing, of course, is the important distinction between whole and refined grains, very different. And then the other thing that I really like to invoke, there are lots of RCTs that have looked at the effects of whole grains. They consistently show benefit in terms of cardiometabolic risk markers. There are the large cohort studies out of Harvard and other places, the Nurses Health Study, Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, all consistently showing higher intake of whole grains, lower rates of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. The other thing I like is ethnography and grains, whole grains are a mainstay in all five of the world's blue zone populations. So in Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan, Loma Linda, California, Nicoya Peninsula and Costa Rica, very diverse diets, but whole grains are a significant feature in all of those. So abundance of evidence from multiple sources indicates whole grains, good, not bad, despite some of these popular books. What about fish? All of the epidemiology would tend to argue that eating fish is good for people. Um, and up to a point, I think that's probably true. But here as well, we have to ask the instead of what question. I thought to ask this actually after a family trip to Hawaii some years ago when I was snorkeling and seeing all these beautiful fish and then we were having seafood dinners. And I started to feel really uncomfortable about this. I, you know, I loved swimming with these guys and now I'm eating them. That, that just doesn't feel right. So I, I actually wrote a column for US News and World Report, there's something fishy about my diet, uh, and made significant changes to my diet at that time. But here too, we have the question, you know, eating fish may be good for people, but it's certainly not good for the fish, and we're depleting the world's oceans and fisheries. That's a critical consideration. So even if fish is good for people, this has to be a small part of the diet. It has to be practiced in a sustainable way. But the instead of what question still pertains, we do not have a trial, by the way. I've actually spoken to colleagues who are very interested in this, uh, and I, I suspect it will be done relatively soon. But we don't have a trial where there are willfully optimized versions of a plant-exclusive diet, so whole food, plant-exclusive, and optimal pescatarian, which is mostly the same foods, but which makes some room for wild, sustainably uh, sourced fish. And you know, what, what would the differences be? Is, is there a net human health benefit from fish consumption? Or if fish into the diet is displacing, for example, lentils and beans, is there actually a net detriment? Now, we, we may be inclined to conjecture, actually, when you have an optimal plant-exclusive diet to begin with, there's a net detriment if you introduce fish. We don't know that. That's provable. That, that's empirically uh, demonstrable in a relatively short period of time, at least in terms of looking at surrogate markers. Such a study ought to be done. But as noted, uh, I used to eat fish pretty routinely and no longer do that. Um, eggs, uh, we've seen studies go both ways. Classic case of instead of what? If you do a study where eggs are coming into a typical American or typical UK diet, where they may be displacing muffins, pastries, 
uh, bagels, white bread, refined flour, added sugar for breakfast, and instead you're eating eggs, actually eggs may represent a considerable improvement. And, and by the way, this for those of us who, who advocate for plant-based eating, this does obligate us to be honest brokers of the relevant information, right? I mean, there, there are plant-based ways of eating that are bad. You know, you, you can be vegan and have a junk food diet. And in the context of a junky vegan diet, the introduction of eggs actually could represent a nutritional improvement. Other considerations here as well, how are the hens being caged and treated? Often it's horrendous and on and on it goes. But those problems can be relieved with small family farms. And so locally sourced eggs, the hens may be treated perfectly well, they may be well fed, there may be no abuse of animals, the environmental impact may be negligible. What then about the nutritional effects of eggs? It entirely depends on what they're replacing. You replace sugary breakfast cereal with eggs, you're probably trading up. In, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with ad campaigns in, in you know, this side of the pond, but uh, Dunkin' Donuts uh, advertises in this country routinely, America runs on Dunkin'. Sounds about right to me. I think donuts are a fairly typical American fuel. Uh, well, you know, if that's the case, eggs are better than donuts for breakfast. On the other hand, if the alternative to eggs is fruit and nuts and whole grains, uh, steel cut oats, for example, with mixed berries, massively better than the egg. So instead of what? I've actually, it, in my lab over the years, we published several studies showing neutral effects of eggs in people with normal health, with dyslipidemia, and even in people with coronary disease. But that's because we were comparing yes or no eggs in the context of the typical American diet. Very, very different if you look at the context of an optimal plant-based diet. So I think there's a basis to argue eggs certainly can be bad, relative to optimal foods. They can also be made to look good relative to the generally fairly horrendous foods uh, people in, in the UK and the US eat as a matter of routine. Many of the same issues relate to dairy. What complicates the discussion of dairy is the issue of adaptation. So let, let me just briefly segue there. And again, just by way of reminder, uh, you know, the, the, the basic premise linking together this flight of ideas for you today is the notion that we need to chew carefully on diet science. Uh, we ought to spit out any dogma we encounter. One of the things that I, I would argue with passion is there need be no dogma on the menu, uh, but we really do need to apply sense uh, and chew carefully before swallowing any of what is being peddled to us. We hear messages all the time about dairy, both from those who advocate for it and from those who oppose it. And I think both camps tend to gravitate toward propaganda and dogma. And, you know, and those of us who are honest brokers where science and sense come together will acknowledge the extremes in both directions. So what about adaptation? We hear routinely, you know, humans should not consume dairy because it's not normal for mammals to consume the, the milk of any species other than their own. It should be their mother's milk and that's it. Well, you know, if, if that argument rooted in adaptation is valid, then we also have to concede that since the dawn of agriculture, there have been whole human populations that have adapted to dairy consumption. Lactose intolerance is the normal mammalian state. I trust you all know that. All mammals have a gene that clones for lactase. They produce it in infancy and when they're weaned, they stop. That gene turns off, they don't make lactase and all mammals then become lactose intolerant. This was true of Homo sapiens as well, but it stopped being true. It stopped being true when there was a survival advantage in the ability to continue to digest lactose and milk and dairy products successfully, probably originally among the Vikings uh, and, and their harried efforts to survive in, in Greenland. Uh, but, you know, Northern Europe in general, there were advantages uh, in, in continuing to be able to make good use of, of dairy. So that's adaptation too. Natural selection didn't stop when we exited the Stone Age. So in for a penny, in for a pound, uh, if we're going to invoke adaptation, it cuts both ways. But again, all the same issues pertain here. So if we look at this in a nutritional context, is dairy good or bad compared to what? We have a lot of studies uh, in the literature suggesting an advantage to weight management in kids with consumption of dairy, but that's because otherwise our kids tend to be drinking Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Is milk better than that? Yeah. Uh, is whole milk maybe better than fat-free milk because it is more satiating? Well, yeah, maybe so. On the other hand, if you look at an optimal plant-based diet where the primary hydration beverage is water and you add milk, 
the net harms, uh, adverse effects on the lipids, adverse effects on, on many cardiometabolic risk markers. And we have all the same issues here when we think about environmental impact. If we're raising cattle to produce dairy, it's not as extreme as raising cattle to eat them, but it's the next greatest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, depletion of aquifers and so forth. And again, there's the issue of ethics. Um, things are always better on small family farms, but certainly in large factory farming operations for dairy, uh, the animals are not treated very well. Uh, so, you know, again, there, there's a strong argument here that looking through those three lenses, the world has a significant reason to cut way back on its consumption of dairy, whether or not it needs to be eliminated. We have wound up with a very important false narrative about saturated fat. Uh, it, we keep getting uh, the message that butter is back, however false that may be. Um, so I just want to quickly debunk this for you. This isn't expressly about dairy, but it's as good a place to take up the topic as any. And, and, and this issue just refuses to go away. It keeps coming up in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, the American Heart Association attempted to put an end to the debate with this state-of-the-art review on saturated fats, but it immediately met a, a, a rebuttal in the form of a so-called state-of-the-art review that reached the opposite conclusion um, with uh, authors who had prominent ties to the dairy industry as fate would have it. But the, the foundation for this argument that saturated fat has been exonerated is two meta-analyses, uh, which some of you may have read. Uh, if we were in a room together, I'd be asking you who's read these, uh, who's read Siri Torino at all 2010, Chattery et al. 2014. Uh, it, the answer is however devoted you may be to, to the topic, uh, many of you have not read these because let's face it, reading the method section of a meta-analysis is apt to make your eyeballs catch fire. Uh, it's really a tedious slog. But I've read them both because it's my job to read them both. And I can tell you basically what they said. What they've been parlayed into in a game of telephone or Chinese whispers, you know, where you basically take the original science and then somebody who doesn't read it or understand it writes a blog and then everybody else simply writes a blog about the prior blog and by the time you get to the end of this the opinions that are being spouted out into cyberspace have nothing whatever to do with the original science that's what's happened here what these two studies basically said is across a range of saturated fat intake in populations around the world in particular the u.s rates of heart disease were high and constant at the low end of the saturated fat intake range and at the high end of the saturated fat intake range. Rates of heart disease were high and constant. Therefore, saturated fat is good for us now. Does that follow logically? I actually studied logic in college. Uh, it doesn't follow logically to me. It does, however, beg two questions. The first question is, well, what was the range? And the answer is in both of these meta-analyses, the range was high and narrow. In other words, at the high end and the low end of saturated fat intake, everybody was consuming more saturated fat than recommended because that's what people in modern countries do. And they weren't very far apart. It was a pretty narrow range. So across that narrow range, rates of heart disease were high and constant. That's question one. Question two, the critical question, when people were eating less saturated fat, what were they eating instead? The instead of what question? Neither of these meta-analyses looked at that. In fact, the Chowdhury paper in 2014, I searched the full text of this paper for the word sugar, assuming that they would say maybe one of the reasons lower saturated fat intake does not associate with lower rates of heart disease is because it's associated with higher intake of refined carbohydrate and added sugar. You would think they would at least speculate in that direction. The word sugar does not appear in this entire manuscript, not once. Thankfully though, it does appear in follow-up research, which acknowledges that when people in modern countries are eating a bit less pepperoni pizza, they're probably eating a lot more low-fat junk food like Snackwell cookies. So that issue was taken up by Lee and colleagues at Harvard. So they looked at 100,000 people over 30 years and specifically carved out those who reduced their intake of saturated fat over time and then asked what replaced those calories. And here's what they found. If people reduce saturated fat calories and replace them with trans fat calories, they gave up butter, started eating stick margarine. Can't really do this anymore because it's gone away, but back in the day when you could do it, well, that was bad. They were going from the frying pan into the fire. Rates of heart disease actually went up. No surprise, we know that trans fat's a bad actor. When people cut down on saturated fat intake from meat, processed meat, dairy, processed dairy, 
and replace those calories with refined carbohydrate and added sugar. So, you know, they were, they were eating less uh, bacon and eggs, but, you know, eating more muffins and Danish for breakfast or sugary breakfast cereals. That, that was a lateral move, actually, with regard to heart disease. No, no real difference in terms of heart disease or overall mortality. There is more than one way to eat badly. And people in both of our countries are committed to exploring them all. Let's be clear about that. But importantly, when people reduce their intake of saturated fat and replace those calories with unsaturated fat from nuts, seeds, olives, avocado, and to a lesser extent, fish and seafood rates of heart disease plummeted. And when they reduce their intake of saturated fat and replace those calories with whole grain calories, rates of heart disease again plummeted. In other words, everything we thought we knew about saturated fat all along was right. And there's been a smoke screen that's been placed between the public and that understanding. So don't you fall for that. What about lectins? Uh, work of uh, Stephen Grundy, a cardiologist popularized in the plant paradox, the idea that we don't dare eat foods that contain lectins because these may have adverse effects in human health. Uh, I think this is preposterous. Uh, there are lectins in beans, and yes, it's true, there are certain beans you should not eat raw, but I don't know anybody who eats kidney beans or pinto beans or garbanzo beans raw anyway. Um, if you cook them, you denature the lectins and the problem goes away. Uh, there are lectins in grains, there are lectins in fruits, there are lectins in vegetables. In other words, if you avoid lectins on the basis of Grundy's advice, you avoid all of the world's most highly nutritious foods associated with all of the best health outcomes. Uh, so I, I think this was just a case of let me manufacture a harebrained hypothesis that will make me provocative and iconoclastic and help me sell a lot of books because that's the formula. Tell people that everything they thought they knew up until yesterday morning was wrong, that everybody else they've ever heard from is a moron, that you are the one true renegade genius, the nutrition messiah, follow me now, formula for a best-selling book but it's a whole load of hooey. So I don't buy anything we've ever heard from Grundy about lectins. Alcohol, I don't know that we need to spend much time here, except to note that a couple of years ago, there was a big Lancet study that everybody took to say, any level of alcohol intake is bad. There can be no health benefits of alcohol. That's not true. The study in the Lancet that got global headlines was an ecological study. It looked at intake of alcohol by populations of countries and associated harms. And it will not shock you to discover that the lowest level of harms attributed to alcohol occur in countries where nobody consumes any alcohol. Big surprise there. It told us nothing about the effects in individuals. So in other words, if you drink a moderate amount judiciously, you don't drink and drive, you don't drink and operate heavy machinery, in other words, you follow the rules, might you be able to derive pleasure from a glass of wine with your dinner or beer with your dinner <clears throat> and actually derive a cardiovascular benefit as well. Nothing refuted that. But for those of you who enjoy a Mediterranean style diet and a, you know, enjoy a glass of wine with a good meal, uh, good news here. Or, or you know, maybe it's room temperature beer, what, what, whatever <laughs> your palate requires. But uh, again, we have to be careful about alcohol. It's clearly uh, at best a double-edged sword in public health. I would not consume alcohol for a health benefit. Uh, but if you consume a reasonable amount in reasonable ways for the pleasure of it, it is possible that there is still a cardiovascular benefit, albeit a modest one. The Lancet study did not obviate that possibility. One of the more important considerations when we look at the trees here is ultra-processed food. This is really bad on an environmental scale. The more you process food, the more you are generating carbon in the manufacturing steps, in the, in the transport steps. Uh, just as a quick aside here, Marion Nessel uh, at NYU, whose work you may know, uh, wrote Soda Politics a few years back. And in her book, she estimated that to produce one drinkable liter of Coke or Pepsi in a plastic bottle requires 600 liters or up to 600 liters of water. Uh, two thirds of that water utilization is in the production of the beverage. The remaining third is in the production uh, of the plastic bottle. So yes, we need to avoid plastic bottles for many reasons. But on the other hand, I think this is a message that could reach young people, millennials, right? They may not yet be worried about their weight or, or diabetes, but they care about the planet. They care about thirsty people, at least I hope they do. And the idea that you're dumping out 599 liters of perfectly good potable water so that you can have Coke instead really ought to horrify them. 
uh, in, in an increasingly thirsty world. So in any event, uh, ultra processing, environmentally bad, uh, we know that. But we also now have definitive evidence courtesy of Kevin Hall at the NIH that ultra processed food leads directly to weight gain. And by the way, we have Carlos Montero, University of Sao Paulo in Brazil and others to thank for the NOVA classification of processing. So it, it used to just be we talk about highly processed food and we'd have to say, well, you know, we recognize it when we see it. We now have an actual operational definition, the NOVA scale, it's a nice addition. And it empowers people like Dr. Hall to then do studies that take advantage of that. And so Kevin has demonstrated that if you keep everything else the same, but just change the degree of processing, ultra processing leads to hyperpalatability, overconsumption and weight gain. This is an important contributor to obesity. And by the way, th this may be news to researchers who are doing the good work of nutrition. It's not news to the food industry. They've known about it for decades. Look at the date here. This is 2006. This was the fourth article in a four part expose in the Chicago Tribune that talked about the collaboration between one of the world's biggest food manufacturers, Kraft Food, and one of the world's biggest tobacco companies, Philip Morris, sharing functional MRI machines to study the human brain because the tobacco scientists wanted to know how do we get people, especially young people, hooked on cigarettes. And the food scientists wanted to know what do we need to put in food so people can't stop eating it until their arm gets tired from lifting it to their mouths. And this has been revisited more recently by Michael Moss, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist who wrote Salt, Sugar, Fat. This was a New York Times Magazine cover story excerpted from that book, The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. And by the way, Michael's new book, Hooked, is due out very soon. I commend it to you. What about nutrigenomics uh, among the trees here? Yes, we are quite varied, uh, but we're all one great big human family. We're more alike than different. And that really is the latest word on nutrigenomics. Yes, it's relevant. Yes, we can customize diets. Yes, some people will do better on this than that or that than this. But the latest word on the science of this is it's not ready for prime time. This is courtesy of my friend Christopher Gardner, Stanford University and his colleagues. Uh, the diet fit study. Uh, people were randomized to low fat or low carb diets. Both were put together in exactly the same way, same attention to detail, comparable overall quality. Um, and people were genomically assessed going in, their insulin sensitivity was assessed going in, and how people did on either diet had nothing, nothing, zero to do with their genomic predispositions or even their insulin sensitivity. Everybody did better than their baseline diet on either a high quality low fat or a high quality low carb diet, made no difference. Nutrigenomics is interesting, it will evolve. It's not where the bulk of the action is today. Okay, enough with the trees. In the time remaining, let's talk forest. What's the big picture here? Well, this is where the two roads diverge in the yellow wood and we'll take the road less traveled perhaps, it will make all the difference. Let's talk about both roads, what diet can do and what diet can do it. So what diet can do is incredible. Uh, and you already know this, so I won't belabor it. I will simply mention, I finished my training in internal medicine in 1991 and I was not satisfied. I wasn't satisfied with what I'd learned about taking care of people who got really sick because so many people who got really sick never needed to get really sick in the first place. So I really wanted to know more about that. What could I do to prevent that? So I found my way to Yale and the preventive medicine residency and, and my training in public health. I finished that program in 1993, the year this paper came out. And, and it, you know, I don't know how many of you can say a single peer reviewed paper changed the trajectory of your career, but I really can. Because I, at the time I was still thinking very much about developing and testing novel hypotheses, answering the next really interesting question that no one had thought to ask. And then this paper came out just a few months after my graduation, actual causes of death in the United States. And as I trust you know, McGinnis and Figge enumerated a list of 10 factors that collectively explained all of the premature deaths that happen in the US every year. But 80% of those premature deaths every year were attributable to just the first three things on the list of 10. And they were feet, forks, and fingers. Physical activity or lack thereof, poor dietary patterns, and fingers, bringing cigarettes to the lips. Tobacco was number one. Tobacco was number one, diet, physical activity, numbers two and three. Well, you know, we already knew what the problem was. And we already knew how to fix it. And that would eliminate 80% of premature death and chronic disease. I said, that's a career. Turning what we know into what we do, that's a career. I can't justify going after the next unknown thing when what we already know would eliminate 80% of premature death and chronic disease in the world, the modern world, 
I have to devote my career to translation, working on turning knowledge into the power of routine action. That's what I've done. Anyway, uh, we had that information uh, almost 30 years ago from McGinnis and Fagey. We had an update 10 years later from Ali Makdad and others at the CDC. Uh, and more recently, uh, just about a year ago in the New York Times, we got this from Darish Mozafarian, whose name you may know, Dean of Nutrition at Tufts, uh, and Dan Glickman, whose name you may not know on your side of the pond, uh, former Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. Our food is killing too many of us. In the United States, and I apologize, apologize as ever for ethnocentricity, I know our epidemiology better than yours, but very comparable. Uh, 500,000 people die prematurely of poor diet quality every year in this country. Pretty incredible, especially in the context of COVID. So, you know, we've had over 300,000 deaths uh, due to COVID. We have over 500,000 deaths every year due to poor diet quality, which we are totally in control of. And we allow that to happen at hides in plain sight. So th this information is readily available. Uh, we also know that we can flip this equation around. Earl Ford and colleagues uh, looked at a population as part of the EPIC study, 23,000 adults in and around Potsdam, Germany. They compared those who didn't smoke, ate vegetables, fruits, whole grains routinely, in other words, a good diet, were physically active, had a healthy weight. The people who did smoke, ate badly, didn't exercise, and had poor weight control. These people, over the multi-year span of the study, had an 80% lesser incidence of all major chronic disease than these people. Flip the switch from bad to good on any one of these factors, and the incidence of any major chronic disease goes down about 50%, but fire on all four, 80% less likelihood to develop heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, et cetera, over a multi-year span, and as far as we know, over a lifetime. And, and this is a study that's been shown again, or a finding rather, that's been demonstrated again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And I, I'm flashing these at you. You can have the slides, you'll have the bibliography. Uh, it's just robustly demonstrated in the epi literature that we can eliminate 80% of chronic disease with lifestyle considerations. And these considerations reverberate to within the double helix of DNA. You all know Dean Ornish. Uh, this was one of his studies, not about the heart, but about the prostate. 30 men with early stage prostate cancer were given a lifestyle medicine intervention. And they went on then to study the effects on gene expression. And they found that 500 cancer promoter genes were effectively turned off with lifestyle as medicine. And 50 cancer suppressor genes shown here very much turned on. Left is before, right is after, red is off, green is on. This was the effect of optimal plant-based nutrition, routine physical activity, no toxins like tobacco or excess alcohol, adequate sleep, stress mitigation, strong social connections, or if you will, the six-cylinder engine of lifestyle is medicine, feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. Fire on all six. After that, everything is vanishingly less important. And, and this issue of genetic and epigenetic effects of lifestyle is a burgeoning part of the peer-reviewed literature, as I trust you all know. So we entered the genomic age thinking that DNA was destiny. It's not, but dinner certainly is. So what we do with lifestyle changes the behavior of our very genes. Critical issue. It also can change the architecture of our chromosomes, lengthening our telomeres, these green caps at the ends. And that work is associated with a Nobel Prize in Medicine to Elizabeth Blackburn uh, at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, she's collaborated with Dean Ornish uh, and others and, and demonstrated that lifestyle interventions can actually lengthen telomeres. Uh, and, you know, we, we also can look at this through a lens darkly and say, you know, once again, that when we look at the global burden of disease, the, the burden of, of disease in the UK and the US, uh, diet actually ranks number one now. It's, it's the single leading adverse exposure. And again, right now everything's a bit distorted by COVID, but year in, year out. Uh, rates of obesity, this, these color-coded men, this is not a political map or a COVID map. Uh, this is uh, obesity rates in the US, they just keep rising. Uh, this is a COVID map. And uh, th th these were the good old days when things look better than they do right now. The, the whole country is crimson again. But, you know, essentially we saw considerable overlap between the burden of chronic disease and, and acute risks of COVID. Uh, colleagues and I actually addressed this issue in a couple of papers we did in the Journal of Emerging Infectious Disease. <coughs> we've, we've estimated that six out of 10 Americans, and I don't think it's too different in the UK, have at least one of the major cardiometabolic risk factors for bad COVID outcomes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary disease, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, severe obesity. 
uh, six out of 10 have at least one of those, four out of 10 have two or more of those. This is overwhelmingly diet and lifestyle related. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, this, this is widely recognized now as a, as a global issue in the US, our progress against heart disease has stalled largely because of adverse diet. So what diet can do is incalculable. Now, what diet can do, what we want diet to do, uh, before we jump in there, I just want to quickly point out, again, I was asked to talk about sense and science. I want to commend to your consideration this paper uh, we published a little over a year ago, Hierarchies of Evidence Applied to Lifestyle Medicine. One of the critical issues about scientific evidence is making sure we interpret it in context. Uh, and I would just point out to any parents in the group that you've never read an RCT, uh, telling you that it's ill-advised for children to run with scissors, but you probably believe it anyway. I just wanna remind you that randomized control trials are an important tool, but they are not the only means by which the human brain gains understanding. And so we have to seek understanding in context. Not everything we wanna do in lifestyle medicine is amenable to an RCT, certainly not uh, the long-term effects on overall vitality and longevity. Uh, so we talked about different ways of synthesizing evidence that would honor the value proposition of lifestyle medicine. And if we're going to preach the gospel of lifestyle as medicine, we need to use synthesis methods for our evidence that makes sense of it. So I commend to your attention this paper. But once we apply science and sense to the issue of nutrition, things get really simple really fast. Michael Pollan got it down to these famous seven words, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, I did a, a review article on request in 2014, Annual Review of Public Health, can we say what diet is best for health? And my paper was a lot longer than seven words, but that was pretty much my conclusion. The basic theme of optimal nutrition for homo sapiens is indeed a diet of real food, minimally processed, plant predominant, if not plant exclusive, lots of vegetables, fruits, beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, whole grains, plain water when thirsty, everything else after that should be a modest contribution, uh, or that should be the end of the story right there, either way, that needs to be the foundation of every healthy diet. But there are variations on that theme. That could be flexitarian, pescatarian, mediterranean, vegetarian, vegan, et cetera, et cetera. It could be higher or lower in fat. There are many different ways to put that basic pattern together. The theme is not negotiable. The variations on the theme are, and that's as it should be because everybody should be the boss of their own lifestyle. And this conclusion reverberates uh, across a vast expanse in the peer-reviewed literature. For the sake of time, I won't belabor it, but you know, people like Frank Hugh, Chair of Nutrition at Harvard, uh, Jim Mann, University of Auckland, uh, Darish Mozafarian again at Tufts and, and many others. Our dietary guidelines, when they're honest, which they aren't reliably, uh, reach much the same conclusion here. We had a consensus conference uh, in 2015 with, with warring nutrition factions and, and sought out the common ground. Uh, and there was agreement there as well. I commend this to you, by the way. It's a, it's a really unique conference. Um, so just Google old ways, common ground. You'll see the diversity of scientists who came together, the diversity of perspectives, and yet we were able to publish a consensus statement saying people should mostly eat minimally processed foods, um, whole plants whenever possible. Uh, and everything else, you could debate what the place might be in a healthy diet, but that part's not negotiable. So check this out, old ways, common ground. And again, I told you I like the example of the blue zones because this is what happens in whole populations over a span of generations. You can't look at that with RCTs. And if we think of the blue zones on a spectrum from animal food predominant and ultra processed food predominant diets on the left to plant food predominant and real food predominant on the right, they cluster at the right extreme. These are all plant predominant, real food predominant diets. And although they're very diverse populations with very diverse lifestyles, this is something they have in common and Dan Buettner considers it very important. There's lots of argument these days about, you know, looking back to the Stone Age. Well, you know, Dorothy, we're not in the Stone Age anymore. We were isolated roaming bands of hunter gatherers in a great big empty world of inexhaustible resources. Back then, we're now a hungry horde of 7.8 billion homo sapiens with the capacity to destroy our planet. But the adaptations that we uh, were endowed from our Stone Age existence certainly are relevant. We're constitutional omnivores, and that means we have choices. We should make good ones. We have choices for fat. Uh, and the issue here is basically that total fat quantity doesn't matter much, but the source of fat matters a lot. Uh, so this study out of Harvard 
uh, the higher the total intake, uh, again, 100,000 or more people followed for generally about 30 years, so 3 million person years of observation, higher total intake of saturated fat from meat, processed meat, dairy, processed dairy, the higher the rate of all-cause premature death, the higher the intake of unsaturated fat from nuts, seeds, olives, avocado, et cetera, the lower the rate of uh, premature death from all causes. Choices for protein, same story, higher the intake of animal protein, the higher the rate of all-cause mortality, the higher the percentage of calories from plant-based proteins, the lower the rate of all-cause mortality. Everything points in the direction you expect it to. Very happy to cite the work of my new colleague at Diet ID, Adam Bernstein, who joined us very recently. This was a 2010 paper when he was at Harvard. And just let your eyes drop down to the very bottom. This was the nurse's health study. This was cardiovascular disease in women, looking at specific food substitutions and the single biggest drop, although you do see it crosses the line of unity, but still the error bars massively to the left of that line of unity with reduced risk when you substitute beans, for beef, massive environmental benefit when you do that too, by the way. Uh, and on that basis, uh, colleagues and I did a paper uh, last year arguing that we should actually update the definition of protein quality. People talk about meat as high quality protein. Well, it's a source of high quality amino acids in good concentrations, but it's not high quality protein if the net effect of eating the food is you're more likely to have a heart attack, is it? What we really care about, you know, high quality protein sources should mean higher quality health, should mean a higher quality environment. Well, when you look at protein that way, and you consider the distribution of amino acids, the concentration of protein, and the health effects, and the environmental effects, when you look at all of that, beans and lentils are at the top, beef is nowhere near the top. That's what we argue ought to happen in this paper, so I commend this to your attention as well. Choices for carbohydrate, again, very quickly, it's all about quality. Everything from lentils to lollipops is carbohydrate. The notion that they're all created equal is absurd, so we need to talk about foods, not macronutrient classes. Talking about carbohydrate basically is just a smokescreen uh, for people who have a nutritional ideology and don't actually want to explore the epidemiology. And all these same choices that we can make for our own sakes are better for the planet, they're better for preserving aquifers, they're better for stabilizing the climate. Uh, what we eat has a massive effect on both of those. Beef is off the charts relative to everything else and all the other leading contributors to aquifer depletion, greenhouse gas emissions are animal foods. There's some plant foods that register fairly high, but overwhelmingly we would do the planet a massive favor if we cut massively back on our intake of animal foods. Uh, clearly beneficial for the preservation of biodiversity. Most conservation experts argue it's the single most important thing we could do. And so I don't want to be the reason, you know, that if some processed food I eat uh, is, is why the last tree in Borneo that a orangutan might have climbed is cut down. So this also requires us to cut way back on highly processed food. So eating beef is the biggest issue, but eating highly processed food is the next biggest. And of course, you're all aware of this. We're contributing to mass extinction. And, and the good news here, it, it needn't have been this way, and I apologize, I wanna wrap up so we can get to Q&A. It needn't have been the case that optimal eating for people and optimal eating for the planet are the same, but they really are. They, there's an opportunity for environmental improvement, nutritional improvement, uh, and economic improvement as well. These things all come together. Uh, this is beautifully laid out in the Eat Lancet Commission report. Uh, and it's been argued that the diet recommended there is too expensive for people, but there's also work uh, both out of Tufts in this study, and I think in particular this study out of Oxford, uh, which has noted that the global savings from shifting in the direction of an optimal plant-based diet are, are staggering. Uh, or if the time horizon is right, and we look at, we get through the expense of transitioning, and then we start to look at the savings associated both with mitigating the damage of climate change and improving human health. Uh, we're talking about many tens of trillions of dollars. Uh, I mean, sums that the human mind can't really effectively process. This is the work of Marco Springman, who was part of the Eat Lancet Commission, Mike Rayner, Pete Scarborough, and, and their colleagues. Uh, so again, we're, we're, we're fritting away enormous amounts of money on the current system. It's badly broken. So we really do have this opportunity for a great confluence. And again, uh, Greta's with me. Uh, you really can't be a health professional in 2021 unless you advocate for the health of the planet. We all need to do that. I think we should argue that the biggest threat to optimal nutriture is not sugar or saturated fat. It's misinformation and dogma. Uh, you know, there's just so much of that, whether it's about COVID or politics or nutrition, that's 
that's the game of our day and we all have to play it to win it. Um, so, you know, again, the, the issue with uh, meat really should have been laid to rest, but it was reanimated when the Annals of Internal Medicine published a whole bunch of papers a year or so ago and gave us new guidelines telling people just keep eating the current amount of, sat, uh, of meat and processed meat and all will be well. And this is absurd. Uh, this was just a small group of people with an agenda who essentially impersonated a group that had the authority to issue dietary guidelines. Uh, I do want to note before wrapping up here, we manage what we measure. Usually in medicine, if stuff matters, we measure it routinely. Blood pressure is important. We all know that. We also know we ought to measure it routinely, and we do. But diet is the single most important health variable, and yet how often is it accurately measured? How many electronic health records capture an objective measure of diet quality? Traditionally, they don't, uh, and they should. According to the American College of Cardiology, this came out just within the last few months saying that there should be a measure of diet quality in every clinical encounter. It, it was, this was reemphasized in the popular science press, diet evaluation at routine checkups. Uh, my career has shifted from academia to the private sector because I invented a means of doing this, and we're working to make diet the vital sign we think it deserves to be. Uh, the company's called Diet ID. You can learn more at dietid.com. But the way the method works is like an eye test. Uh, we show you two images of diets and ask you which looks more like stuff you eat, A or B, and you say B, we say, how about now, A or B, and you play that game for 30 seconds and we've got you. So we can, we can basically land on a comprehensive dietary assessment in under a minute, uh, and we do this digitally. So it's possible now for diet to be the vital sign it deserves to be. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the end here, I really want to place the emphasis not just on science and sense, but on the confluence of the health of people and planet. It's all really one thing. And of course, as we look at issues of health now, we have to quickly consider the pandemic. Uh, and as noted earlier, colleagues and I have weighed in here um, and have noted that these cardiometabolic liabilities due to diet and lifestyle are massive contributors to adverse COVID outcomes. They overlap, uh, of, unfortunately, with uh, socioeconomic disparities as well. So that there, there are communities where essentially it's a perfect storm uh, subjecting them to the ills of the pandemic. Obesity is a major reason for bad outcomes in younger people. Uh, the mechanisms of that, some are obvious, some less so, and still under active investigation. Inflammation, um, impaired immune system response is obviously a key element here. And diet is a key element in fixing it. We have a, a paper that's currently under review where we've estimated that 40% of all COVID hospitalization could be eliminated just by improving overall cardiometabolic health with lifestyle as medicine. So you could argue that for us in lifestyle medicine, two pandemics are better than one because if we're all just about COVID, we'd be in the same sinking ship as everybody else. But if a lot of this is about modifiable risk factors in cardiometabolic disease, we know how to fix that. And there's never been a more compelling argument for chronic health as the remedy both to chronic disease and the acute threat of COVID. Okay, my apologies to the host here for going a bit long, uh, but I will stop there and be very happy to take questions in the time that remains. Thank you, David. That was an awesome overview of all the arguments for a plant-based diet. Uh, and you've really kept us engaged on this wintry cold night over in the UK. Um, we're getting a huge number of questions, so that just goes to show how engaging you are. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, so if you can press the thumbs up participants on any questions you particularly want us to ask, they will shoot to the top and we will uh, kick off with those perhaps first. Um, but I, from my background with the uh, British Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which is a charity uh, that tries to support clinicians and patients with the evidence for lifestyle uh, changes and behavior change that not just nutrition, but all the other pillars of lifestyle. Um, my question is going to be really about how we can help clinicians who are, and patients pragmatically on an individual level. Um, and my specific challenge I think as a practicing GP in the UK which most of our members are in the BSLM certainly is that when we sit in our clinics with patients um, we really have to go through the risks and the benefits of any change that we're trying to talk through with them and I think it would be nice to hear from you what you think the risks might be and uh, of a plant-based diet and I think the number one that always uh, comes from patients when I'm talking to them 
is the risk of social exclusion and isolation from their cultural group. Because we hear a lot that food is medicine, but it isn't. We don't prescribe it. Uh, it has extra, it can work as effectively as medicine, but it has uh, extra significance to most of us. And, you know, we've just been through Christmas and how important here the turkey is, you know, that many of my patients say, well, I, I, won't, I won't be accepted by my, my, my friends if I, if I do that. I can't reject those sorts of foods. So the, the issue about social isolation, I think, you know, it really strikes me at the moment as we head into another COVID lockdown, uh, that social isolation is a greater risk factor for premature mortality than BMI and smoking put together. So, so your views on that, and of course, all, always the, the arguments about B12 and iodine and all those things. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, first of all, Ellen, thank you. Good to be with you. And um, you packed a lot into that question. And, and so in order to pay attention to you and to my answer, I, I won't be doing the thumbs up thing. I saw questions about cooking oils and coconut oil and uh, you know, I'm ha that, that was what I got a quick look at. Happy to answer those, any others that you think are important. But let me try to address this. Uh, so there's a lot here. I agree with you. We are social animals. We need one another. Social isolation is bad, whether it's COVID induced or the fact that you are on the, you know, the world's most restrictive diet and nobody you know is willing to eat with you. Both of those would be bad things. We were, we were chatting before we went live with the webinar that you know, I, I've always espoused the view that lifestyle in medicine can only do so much. We need lifestyle as medicine and that reverberates through culture. And so you know, here's the thing, the way things are isn't necessarily the way things ought to be. We may need to be a little bit patient. Now the planet can't afford for us to wait very long, but the idea that we're going to reverse prevailing dietary inclinations at scale in one fell swoop is a bit naive. But one of the things we could say when we advocate plant-based eating for all these important, compelling, poignant, urgent reasons, better for you, kinder, gentler to our fellow creatures like I think Barley back there on the chair, um, uh, better for the environment, we all need this planet. Uh, okay, yeah, but you're telling me this and my friends don't eat this way. Well, not to worry. Because when your friends go to any other doctor, they're going to get the same message. We're all in this together, too. We're all going to shift in that direction. So, you know, if you can't go all the way there immediately, don't. But ask your friends whether or not they've heard the message. And that's where we come in. Because if every clinician gets on board, nobody will fail to get the memo. So I don't think it's about, look, you ought to eat this way because you're my patient. And nobody you know is going to hear this. No, everybody, you know, ought to hear the exact same thing. And if they're wondering, gee, how can I do this on my own? You should say, I was wondering how I could do it on my own. How about we do it together and help one another? And all of a sudden, there is no social isolation. All of a sudden, this is actually a shared challenge. Let's help one another eat a healthier, more plant-based diet for our own sakes, for the sake of the planet, to be kinder and gentler to our fellow creatures, and you know, make sure that there's a viable planet for the next generation and the next beyond that. Really damn good reasons. So, you know, there couldn't be better arguments for the value proposition of this. And what you're saying is, you know, there's, there are many reasons why it's hard. It's changed, change is hard, it's socially isolating, but it's not if everybody else is trying to do the same thing at the same time. And then it just becomes a matter of how far can you go, how fast. And, and frankly, some of that could involve social engagement because people love competition. So, you know, we, we, we can take advantage of the appification of medicine and telemedicine. You know, and people could get together in groups and compete with one another to see how good can we be about moving in this direction that we all agree people's diets need to move in if we want to save ourselves and the planet. So I, I think there are lots of ways to get there. I, I don't think this resides within the domain of the individual clinician, but I think it does reside within the domain of lifestyle medicine, where essentially we say those of us who are most devoted to this become experts in it and preach the gospel. But every clinician needs to hear the gospel. Every health professional needs to acknowledge the importance of talking about the health of people and planet alike. And as soon as you acknowledge that as the urgent imperative of our time that it is, you're obligated to talk about the importance of plant-based eating because it, you know, it really is the single most impactful, actionable thing an individual can do to contribute to what ails us. Well, then everybody's in on it. Nobody's going to avoid the memo. And then the other thing, you know, just back to how this can actually work in primary care workflows, you know, we wrestle with this at Diet ID and it's our job. It's the job of entrepreneurs, inventors to figure out how can we give you more empowering information in less and less time so that, you know, essentially 
just like you don't spend a lot of time getting a blood pressure, you sit down with a patient and you know, maybe a medical assistant took the blood pressure and you can just react to it. We need to do the same with diet quality. That information about what makes diet good or bad, objective measures of diet quality, that should all happen in the waiting room. And then when they come to you and they sit down with you and the clinical visit begins, it should begin with the relevant biometric information already at your disposal. We can do that. A lot of this can be delivered via telemedicine um, and digitally. So again, you packed a lot into the question. Sorry, the answer, you know, trying to unpack it all went on for a while. But um, you're right. It's a challenge. It's not an insurmountable challenge. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rohini. I don't know if you've picked any off that you want to start with, or if we just go with the, the most popular one at the moment that's got uh, 24 thumbs up. <laughs> Whatever that is. Sure. So Julie Ritter's asked, what's your view on coconut oil sold as a healthy fat? I, you know, I, I, I think it could do worse. Uh, you know, first of all, oils, the, the, the health properties of oils vary with their extraction. Um, coconut oil can be extracted chemically, just like rapeseed oil or canola oil can be extracted chemically. And chemical extraction alters the properties of oils, offers the, alters the fatty acid distribution. Um, so in any instance, uh, cooking oil ought to be mechanically extracted. It ought to be pressed, mechanically pressed. Expeller pressed is often what you see on the label. Um, if there are sensitive compounds, notably antioxidants in the mix, as there are with olive oil, for example, they are best preserved with cold pressing. Uh, so you want organic because, you know, preferably this was something that was grown without the addition of, of potentially harmful chemicals. You want mechanically pressed uh, as opposed to chemically extracted uh, and you want it done in the cold. If such things are done with coconut oil, it's not nearly as good as many others. Now, here's the thing about coconut oil, because it's a highly saturated mix of oils uh, with the predominant contribution from lauric acid, which is arguably a, a medium chain length saturated fat, probably not as atherogenic or inflammatory as palmitic and myristic acid, which predominate in meat and dairy. Um, and because it has good cooking properties and because many people like the taste, sure, you can include it in your cooking. But there's no evidence, not a shred, that you will derive a health benefit from the consumption of coconut oil. None. Uh, and, and anybody who feels differently, any of the 24 of you with thumbs up, you want to send me articles that profess to show decisive net benefit from introducing coconut oil into an otherwise well put together diet, I will be happy to review them. But I've looked, cannot find any such thing. As opposed to, for example, olive oil, where extra virgin olive oil uh, many studies demonstrate favorable effects on endothelial function, platelet aggregation, blood pressure, lipids, et cetera, net health benefit. So I would argue that that's true of extra virgin olive oil. Same conditions, by the way, mechanically extracted cold press. So you know, again, extra virgin olive oil, not just garden variety rancidified olive oil. Uh, same is true of canola oil. Tends to be controversial, don't know why. Uh, the erucic acid that made rapeseed a concern for human health was, was removed from the mix long ago. Um, this was selective breeding rather than GMO. So this is non-GMO canola oil. Um, there are selectively bred varieties of, of canola that are high, naturally high in omega-3, uh, have a very high ratio of monounsaturated fat, low omega-6. I mean, everything about them is pretty much ideal. Uh, and again, mechanically extracted organic. Um, so, uh, you know, in the cat's family pantry, if you care to know, extra virgin olive oil and that kind of canola oil prevail. Uh, I don't know if we have any coconut oil. Um, my wife may have some for, you know, sort of a, a rare uh, culinary adventure. Uh, I don't object to it, but I certainly, I don't think it's rational to consume coconut oil for a health benefit. That's all marketing hype. Thank you. Rohini, I know you had loads of questions as well. I don't want to steal the limelight with a... We've had over 50 questions, so we are going to run over just a little bit, but I definitely, first I want to thank you for such an illuminating talk. I, we've received so many comments saying it was the most riveting and most engaging, best talk they've ever heard on diet and nutrition. Wow, well, thank you all, I appreciate that. Pick off the year with this. Um, but you touched at the end about um, how obesity can increase the severity of the response to COVID-19. And I know that a couple of days ago, the US News and World Report list that you sit on the panel of was published, which showed that plant-strong diets um, were all among the, the best diets as voted for in that list. I think it's a ranking of 39 diets. 
Uh, um, it, it is, and I know because I'm one of the judges, actually. Yes, so I was just about to say <laughs> the, the panel. And um, I would love to know from you, of course, this is a hot topic in January of all months, but what is the best diet for weight loss? And, and if someone was already suffering with obesity, what would you recommend? Is a low-carb diet the best? Is a plant-based diet, you know, um, <laughs> recommended? would love to know what you think. Yeah, well, so, so a few things. First of all, just to quickly address the COVID issue. Uh, and, and to be clear, I am an internist. I'm still licensed to practice medicine. I stopped seeing patients after about 30 years, but I did volunteer uh, during the surge in New York City. So I did some shifts in an emergency department in the Bronx. I did see COVID up close and personal. I did see it kill people. And I also see people that it tried to kill that we were able to save. And one of the ways that people were being saved, this was the very early going, this was last March, was repositioning to improve oxygen distribution. And in addition to the adverse effects of severe obesity on immune system function, hyperinflammation, cytokine storm, et cetera, endocrinopathy, we, we directly encountered the mechanical challenges of severe obesity, which is much harder for those patients to continuously shift around. It was really hard and uncomfortable for them to lie prone. Uh, so th th there's a distinct mechanical disadvantage to severe uh, obesity as well as the metabolic disadvantage. So it, it matters and it, it matters for a number of reasons, some of which are still being explored and enumerated, but some of which are fairly obvious. On the matter of, of diet for weight loss, I mean, the first thing I'd say, and I, I know, you know I'm preaching to the choir here, it, it, can and, and it can and should never be just about weight. Losing weight is not what our, our goal is, right? It's about finding health, finding vitality. And you, sometimes you need to lose weight to find vitality. But, you know, we, we should be vendors of the more positive message. You know, we're in pursuit of finding better health, finding greater vitality, more years in life, more life in years. If you need to lose weight to find more health, okay, we'll sign up. But it's never just about weight. And there are all sorts of problems with a focus on weight. You know, people get the wrong idea that a bathroom scale can measure human worth. That's absurd. Bathroom scales do not measure human worth. Human worth and weight have nothing to do with one another, right? We, our patients, we know that, our patients need to know it. So, you know, even if we care enormously about the health effects of obesity, uh, we shouldn't be shy about saying that, but we should make it clear that we care about obesity in the same way we care about elevated cholesterol, insulin resistance. It's a, it's a marker for increased risk. It's a canary in the coal mine of chronic disease. We take it seriously for that reason, but it's not all about weight. Calories count, uh, you know, it, it, counting them is, is a tedious way to manage your weight for your life, but calories count. So ultimately, if we're gonna address weight management, it's about energy balance. And then after that, um, I would say two things. First, you do not wanna lose weight by the most expedient means in the short term, if it is at odds with what is good for you long-term. I, I have quipped many times over the years that a cocaine binge is a terrific way to lose a lot of weight fast, as is about of cholera. I would not recommend either. All right? So, you know, they're just dropping weight, if that's your only goal, can cause you to misperceive the long lasting health effects of what you're doing. So, we in lifestyle medicine always need to be advocating for what we can do that is decisively beneficial in the short term, meets your objectives, you being the patient and is consistent with long-term health too. We, we don't want these two to part ways. That doesn't make any sense. Once you bound it that way, it, it becomes a matter of a high quality diet that's good for you and a strategy for reducing your intake of calories. How do you do that? Well, I think you have several choices. Um, you can limit the array of foods available to you by adopting some restriction, low fat, low carb. And again, in Christopher Gardner's diet fit studies, same amount of weight was lost, low fat, low carb, because both restricted people's choices to some degree. Both were comparable quality. Genetics played no role. Everybody lost about the same amount of weight on those two very different diets because they were both high quality diets. I don't think macronutrient thresholds are relevant, frankly. I think you can pretty much throw those out unless you have a strong preference. That would be another key consideration, preference. You need to eat in a way that you're actually willing to eat because otherwise it's just talk about diet as opposed to actually eating the food. And if you don't eat the food, uh, the whole conversation is moot. So we need to be willing to meet our patients where they are. If they have, you know, talking a patient who wants to be vegan into the benefits of a, you know, low carb paleo diet is a silly proposition. Help them optimize a vegan diet 
because there are all sorts of things about a vegan diet that will help them achieve weight loss. You know, it, it's basically high volume food, it's satiating, it's energy diluting on and it goes. Yeah, people could lose weight on a paleo diet, but the person who wants to be vegan doesn't need to hear that conversation. The bigger challenge for all of you is what about the patient who does want to be paleo? Well, then you could basically say, okay, you know, that's probably doable. Let's talk about what a valid paleo diet is. There was no paleolithic pastrami or corned beef or pepperoni. You know, that we're talking about eating game, uh, not so easy to do, but you have another option. There was a diet put together by David Jenkins and colleagues at the University of Toronto, an eco Atkins diet. Essentially, it, you know, it's an attempt to take everything we learn from Stone Age native eating, but apply it in a modern world context where we really all need to be eating more plants for the sake of the planet. Can we find common ground here? All right, so you, you actually can look across an expanse of dietary options, reconcile those with what's important for long-term human health, reconcile those with what's important for long-term planetary health and help your patients shop. And again, I don't wanna be a peddler here, but, but at Diet ID, uh, this is what we do. So we, we've stratified into 10 tiers of objectively measured diet quality using the Healthy Eating Index 2015, every kind of diet that prevails in the modern world. We started in North America, this is relevant in the UK too. So we've got paleo and low carb, all the way to vegan. We've got Mediterranean, flexitarian, we've got Dash, we've got Ornish, we're going to add Esselstein, we've got ethnic diets. But they're all objectively stratified into tiers of quality. And at the highest tier of quality, the top tier, 10, tier 10, everything is mostly plants. Now, you know, the vegan diet is exclusively plants, the vegetarian diet is plants with a little bit of dairy and eggs, pescatarian diet is plants with a little bit of fish, but they're all minimally processed food, mostly plants. And so, you know, essentially you could service the interest of any patient who wants to lose weight on a given diet, and we would still all be landing on the same theme. We would just be acknowledging there is a place for variance on the theme. I really like the volumetrics theory, you know, originally popularized by Barbara Rolls, uh, the idea that high volume food fills us up uh, with low uh, cost and calories. But uh, just to refer back, during the slides, I, I invoke the work of Michael Moss and in that four-part expose in the Chicago Tribune from a decade earlier, the food industry willfully engineers processed food to be addictive. In other words, what they're doing is paying scientists bonuses for designing food that maximize the number of calories it takes to feel full. That is the principal reason why obesity prevails in the modern world. All you really need to do to help your patients lose weight, stay leaner, and not be hungry all the time is reverse engineer that. And any approach that takes them away from highly processed food to nutrient rich, relatively, often relatively energy dilute, real food is going to help enormously. That's the goal. And, and so what that means is any dietary variant emphasis on high quality, whole, minimally processed plant foods is the answer, but that could be higher or lower in fat, higher or lower in carbs. You could call it orange, you could call it Esselstyn. They're all variants on a theme. I'm fine with that. So I think you've brilliantly answered Sri Wong's question that was, is probably the top at the moment about how to influence our non-vegan colleagues or the non-plant-based uh, colleagues uh, without them getting defensive. So you've been talking about that common ground, uh, which I think is really important, isn't it? So there seems to be a lot of interest about omega-3s and the content of fish. Um, and a question from an anonymous person who says that, is it true that levels in most intensively reared fish is now negligible as the fish are not fed on a natural diet? And so it, therefore, it, are there any benefits? Yeah, yeah. It, it was a really big issue in the early going of aquaculture. And, you know, what, we have all sorts of problems with the, you know, the, the flow of information on the internet, right? I mean, it's, it's why there's so many conspiracy theories and misinformation, propaganda. But on the other hand, um, you know, there's, there tends to be baby and bathwater everywhere you look. And, and in this case, the baby would be, it's really hard to hide a bad practice. Everything hides in plain sight now, right? So the, the problem with essentially bad feeding practices in aquaculture, so that, that fish that should have been rich in omega-3, like salmon, for example, um, were actually being raised in a diet depleted environment where they didn't generate native levels of omega-3. That problem has been alleviated to some degree. So standards of aquaculture have risen, less of an issue. On the other hand, a lot of the fish that are raised in the aquaculture setting are not naturally rich in omega-3 to begin with. So tilapia are never gonna be rich in omega-3. They don't have the physiology to pack omega-3 into their flesh. It doesn't really matter what you feed them. 
Uh, so it's improving, but I would argue, so what? Um, it's still energy intensive to derive our omega-3 from fish. I think we ought to get it from lower on the food chain. And I think the best place to go for a while, I thought it was krill until I realized we were depleting the world supply of krill. And so, you know, the penguins and the whales were going to go hungry. I didn't want to be the reason for that. Uh, I get mine from algae. Uh, so I take an algae supplement. They're readily available. Uh, they contain exactly the same long chain uh, omega-3, EPA, and DHA in comparable proportions. They're where the fish get them. You basically working your way down the food chain to find out, okay, how did this get into the fish in the first place? And I really do advocate for this. You know, obviously homo sapiens can, um, we can derive uh, plant-based omega-3 from, from any good diets. So we can get it from walnuts and other nuts and flax seeds and so forth. But then we're, you know, we're getting alpha linolenic acid. And while in principle, we can convert ALA into EPA and DHA, we're not very good at it. Uh, now we're variably good at it. Um, actually, ethnic Indians are better at it uh, because of an adaptation over many generations to a vegetarian diet than other populations around the world. Uh, Tom Brenna, uh, who is at Cornell, he's now at the University of Texas, has published on this, different gene frequencies in ethnic Indians and really interesting stuff. So some people are better at it than others. None of us are great at it. And really important, if you have a high intake of omega-6, the evidence is very clear. It actively inhibits the conversion of ALA specifically into DHA. Still can make some EPA, not good at making DHA. DHA is obviously really important to the brain and nervous system and equanimity and mood and affect. I would say, yes, get your ALA from, from walnuts, flax seeds, all great, but you also want to get the long chain uh, omega-3 directly. And I would recommend an algae supplement or, or eat algae if you're so inclined. But the, the, I take an algae supplement daily. Thank you. How are we doing for time, Rahimi? I think that we will have to um, wrap up, but I do. My dogs are getting restless. That, that yeah. is a sign we need to wrap up. They want their daily movement. Um, so I think you know, we have so many incredible questions and I know that you've covered all of these and more in so many podcasts I've heard in your webinars at Diet ID or 19 books that you've co-authored and authored. And I would love to ask, how can everyone who has tuned into this and the many more that will listen and post you know, recording, keep in touch and really um, keep up to date with your work and also which of your books and which of your resources would you recommend most for our listeners? Well, well first of all, thanks to all of you uh, for giving me your time and attention. Those are very valued commodities. I appreciate that very much. Uh, secondly, I apologize for the questions I didn't answer. I, I'm sure they're every bit as good and, and intriguing as the ones that we were able to get to. So my apologies for that. I, inevitably, you give an academic time and we, we use it all up. So sorry. Um, but but it, there is good news. I'd love to stay in touch. My website is davidkatzmd.com. Uh, and it's kind of one-stop shopping. It's a portal to all the other stuff I do. A few things about the other stuff. Uh, please visit the True Health Initiative, truehealthinitiative.org. What I love about the True Health Initiative is it's not me. I founded it, but I founded it as a showcase for the massive global consensus about the fundamentals of lifestyles medicine. And I mean a consensus across an expanse from paleo to vegan. There's so much more agreement than the public realizes. And we put it on display because we ask people to stand up and be counted. So visit truehealthinitiative.org and better still, please join us and support our work. Uh, there's more dietid.com if you want to learn more about the, the innovative method at Diet ID. In terms of books, um, I'll quickly just mentioned three. Uh, the third edition of our textbook, Nutrition and Clinical Practices, has been available for several years. We're wrapping up work on the fourth edition now, and that's specifically intended for the practicing clinician. So Nutrition and Clinical Practice third edition is available now. Uh, most recently, uh, I wrote How to Eat with Mark Bittman, a uh, New York Times food writer for many years. Uh, it's it's really more for your patients than for you, but you may want to recommend it there. It's an easy read. It's conversational. It's available in the UK. Um, the publisher picked it up there. It, 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 it's good. But for, for in general, if you want a, a book that covers everything I know, all the questions I didn't get to answer today, um, it's called The Truth About Food. And this was sort of my magnum opus. It, uh, it, it also comes in really handy. If you get the paperback version and you need to hold the door open in a stiff wind, it'll do the trick. It's 750 pages. Uh, you can also get the Kindle version and then search it electronically. It's much cheaper. But what I like about it is A, it's everything I know, but also how and why I know it because it, you know, it explores all these issues of how do we know what we know and what are the bogus arguments and how do you see through them. 
I think it's really good. And all the proceeds from the Truth About Food go to support the True Health Initiative, which is a cause I care a lot about. So that would be my short list. And thank you, Rohini, for the opportunity to mention those. Thank you. Yes, we have um, the Truth About Food under our resources section on the Plant-Based Health Professionals website and a lot of um, other information around all of these topics. And do visit the SLM and Plant-Based Health Professionals UK website. Sign up to join as a member. Um, anyone can join PHP. You don't need to be a healthcare professional. And um, of course, the SLM um, has a, a number of great events coming up, as do we for the year. So I hope everyone will take the chance after this to have a look. I will try and include as many links to all of your initiatives, Dr. Katz, in the follow-up email to all attendees with their CPD certificate. But thank you for staying on for a little extra time. Hopefully your dogs aren't too um, restless. And I'm going to go open the door. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all so much. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go let the dogs out. Wonderful. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. Stay well.